Uh, let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you again for this wonderful day that you have given us, this beautiful day, for all of the food that you have given us and for those who have worked uh, to prepare it. And we do again ask you, Lord, to uh, bless them for their labors and be with us during this time. Help us to, uh, to uh, think again about um, your word and especially today about Genesis uh, so that we might uh, be able to really have our bearings uh, corrected and uh, know what we ought to do to honor and to glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Okay, just by show of hands, I think this is probably everybody, but did everybody get a chance to watch the video that kind of introduced this thing, the cultural School of Cultural Restoration? There was a video, so that's a no. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what about everybody besides Elizabeth? Yeah, okay. Um, well, the purpose, we, uh, Pastor Steve kind of laid it out pretty well in the video, but um, the purpose of this, you know, we, we want to call it an institution, I guess, is really for the church to become thoroughly acquainted with. Uh, and I think, you know, for a lot of you all, you've probably heard some of this stuff before, but we really just need to kind of keep going over uh, some things and then talk about some new things, be exposed to some new things, uh, perhaps, some new cultural things, uh, so that we as the church can really kind of be the custodians of what a good and true culture is. Um, as our culture kind of continues to go down, uh, you know, in decline in so many ways, well, uh, we're called, as we're going to talk about today uh, in Genesis, we're called to build culture. Uh, we're called to build godly cultures. And there are still remnants of godliness in our culture today, so we have to be able to kind of discern, um, you know, the good things that are there, uh, and then also be able to work on building up those things that are lacking or not there at all. And so to do that, obviously we have to have just a, you know, we've got to always be growing in our knowledge of the scriptures. Uh, we need to know the Bible better. All of us need to know the Bible better. That has to be the foundation from which we can uh, then go about seeking to build a godly culture. Uh, there's no, you know, we, we kind of, you know, I say we collectively, kind of broadly, uh, but a lot of times we can kind of jump into these cultural, you know, topics uh, and really uh, maybe leap past some of the things that the Bible says. So we have to be careful that we don't do that. Um, and because of that, uh, in this... Uh, school of Cultural Restoration, we're always going to have a Bible class. Uh, we'll have two classes going, that's the intent, so we'll always have one Bible class, but then also have another class. This time it's in history, but we might have uh, another on music and art or some other aspect of culture that, um, that we need to, you know, continue to grow, uh, to grow on. So we'll always have a Bible class, and this... Um, this particular class, uh, this five-week section, everybody saw, well, maybe not Elizabeth, but we're going to have basically three, I'm going to keep calling you out over and over and over, <coughs> and this is going to potentially go online if it's, uh, <laughs> should I say your last name too? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, so three five-week sections, uh, sessions, one uh, now, ending in mid-March, then take a break. Uh, start in April again, end in mid-May, and then we'll take a longer break and have one in the fall. That's kind of the plan. So three Bible classes this year. This first one is going to be uh, in uh, kind of an overall look at the whole Bible, uh, which I think uh, in some ways is, uh, you know, maybe not the best uh, way to do things. But uh, as I've thought about it, I think one of the things that we potentially miss sometimes is an understanding of the whole story of the Bible. You know, we might, we might be well acquainted with the Gospels. We might know a lot about Paul's epistles. We might know a lot about the story of Israel, the history of Israel. Uh, but frequently, we can kind of lose track of the whole overarching story. And that overarching story is actually truly amazing. I think that's actually one of the remarkable things about God's Word is that it gives us this whole complete story about <clears throat> the origin of the universe and the destination of the universe, its, uh, its end state. And then, of course, it tells us uh, how we, as man, 
created in God's image fits into that. So it's a pretty uh, remarkable thing, uh, a very unique thing as well. If you, if you think about it, no other, no other religion, no other philosophy has this kind of whole, uh, this, this whole encompassing story that just that covers everything. So it's really um, an, amazing, an amazing thing. So we're going to spend this first five-week session uh, talking about um, the whole story and hopefully connect some of the dots along the way. Um, but uh, today we're going to focus on Genesis. Uh, next week we'll talk about Exodus, uh, Israel, probably up through about Judges. The week after that we'll talk about the monarchy um, and it, there'll be some overlap in all of these obviously, but we'll talk about the monarchy up until about the exile. Then we'll talk about the exile and the prophets uh, in the fourth session and then finally in the fifth session we'll talk about the coming of the kingdom in Jesus, and the new covenant. Um, so that's kind of the overarching plan, I guess. Uh, any questions or comments or anything before we move on? Is this an interrupting lecture series? Uh, sure, yeah. As long as you're not like my students today where uh, <laughs> I don't think we actually talked about one thing that I planned to talk about. <laughs> so that wasn't a very good, it was good discussion, but... Uh, uh, but yes, feel free, uh, definitely feel free to do so. Um, so Genesis, that's the topic for this first lecture. Um, remember, as we just said, that God's word gives us this whole picture of the story. And every story has a beginning. That's what Genesis is. Badrashit is the first word of the Bible, and that just means in the beginning. Uh, so we... Uh, learn about the story, the beginning of the story, as we look at um, that very first word, the opening chapters of Genesis, and then kind of uh, the, the rest of Genesis as a whole. And what we find here in these opening chapters of the Bible, even though it's just a few chapters, they are so rich and so full of important meaning for us, and they kind of set the trajectory for the rest of the biblical story. Uh, you know, what, what is redemption, uh, we, could, we could say, and if we kind of have our New Testament blinders on, we can divorce it from creation. Uh, we can just think about, you know, being saved from our sins or something like that. But really, if we're to think about redemption in a very whole and full sense, we have to think about it in the trajectory, from the trajectory of Genesis, which is all about the creation of the earth, the creation of the world, all of this earthly stuff, bodies and souls. Um, so we have to, we, we really find our bearings here in these opening uh, chapters of Genesis. Now, um, some of this, I think, might be familiar to some of you, some of the terminology, uh, themes and stuff like that. I think I've tried to throw in some new things as well. Uh, just to keep everybody interested, but some of you might not be that acquainted with this, and that's perfectly okay. That's why we're doing this class. So some of the terminology is uh, a little bit familiar, probably. Well, when God created the heavens and the earth, he was building a three-storied house. You've probably heard that before. And we see this, actually, not only in Genesis, but we see it in other places in Scripture as well, but of course Genesis is the first place uh, that this happens. The triune God, and remember this is kind of the, con, you know, uh, there's, there's a plurality uh, in the one God that is involved in the creation account. So the triune God creates the heavens and the, and the earth. And he did so, initially he forms these three uh, spaces, we might call them, in the first three days of creation. In day one, he creates light and he separates it from darkness. In day two, he separates the water from above uh, from the waters below by establishing this firmament, or sometimes we can call it a canopy or a tent, or some translations will just say the sky. So the sky separates uh, these things. And then on day three, he separates the waters from below uh, from the land. There's a separation of the waters from uh, the waters below from the land. So if we kind of just very quickly up above is the firmament. We can see the canopy, the sky. 
then there is the land, and then there is also the waters that are below the earth. Those are the kind of the three stories of the house. Firmament, land, waters below. And one of the interesting places that this comes up again is actually in the second commandment. In the second commandment, God uses this three-story house, this image of a house, when he prohibits the worshiping of idols. Could somebody maybe run back there? Thank you, Aaron. Appreciate it. Um, the worship of, uh, of idols, of graven, graven images. He says, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, top story, or that is in the earth beneath, middle story, or that is in the water under the earth. So, in the first three days, God makes these different spaces of this three-story uh, house. He takes hold of his initial creation, and he restructures it into this uh, three-story house. But then, the interesting thing is that in the next three days, he fills the three-story house. So, in day four, so days one through three, he's building this three-story house. Then, in the next three days, he fills each of the spaces, each of the stories of this house. In day four, he fills the tent, the canopy, uh, the firmament. He fills that above with the sun, moon, and the stars. In day five, he fills the waters above and the waters below with birds and fish. Uh, in day six, he fills the land with animals, and then, you know, as kind of the, the crowning achievement of his creation, he creates man. And then, of course, God rests on the seventh day, and we see the theme, like we talked about, too, with our kind of initial, you know, the establishment of original of uh, trajectories that will play out throughout the rest of the Bible. God rests on the seventh day. There is this theme of Sabbath that plays out uh, all throughout the rest of the Bible, even into the New Covenant where uh, the true Sabbath rest is being uh, in communion with God, being united to Christ is our true Sabbath rest. So, Another uh, way that this structure, this three-story structure is used uh, is when God judges frequently lesser houses. So he's built his big house. He's built the house of creation with these three floors. But the same image of the three-story house is applied to others as well. One of the easiest uh, uh, examples of this is with the house of Egypt, the three-story house of Egypt. Uh, in the first uh, three plagues, remember God gives uh, Egypt ten plagues. Uh, the tenth is where the Passover occurs. But in those first nine, you can kind of divide them up into three different cycles. And each cycle uh, is addressed at the top layer, the middle layer, and the bottom layer of the house or space of the house. So in the first three, in the first three plagues... Um, he turns the water of the Nile into blood. He um, sends frogs. So water is the waters below. He sends frogs to the land. And then he sends gnats in the sky. So he's addressing all three layers, all three stories of the house. In the second three, he does the exact same thing. He sends flies, but this time they come kind of in the water. Uh, he sends pestilence to the land animals, so you have water, land, uh, and then there are boils that don't come through any sort of medium at all, so we can kind of think that they come through, uh, through the sky, we could say. In the last three, he sends hail, ice, water. Uh, he sends locusts to the land, and he sends darkness uh, in the sky. So all three stories of the house of Egypt are attacked three different times. And we can see uh, that this imagery of the three-story house uh, is not only true then for the whole of creation, but it's also true for smaller houses, for uh, Egypt, for Israel in some cases. And we're going to talk about this uh, a little bit more here. But there's several other things that we need to note here on the days of creation. First is the correlation. We touched on this a little bit, but the correlation between the first three days and the second three days. I'm going to put this on the board here. But we have, so day one is, well, let me move it down a little bit here. 
So you have the space, and then you have the filling of the space. Yeah, that's a noisy board, isn't it? Goodness. All right, so you have, uh, what does God create on the first day? Light, and he separates it from dark. Well, what does he create on day four? Something that fills that space, something that governs and rules that space. He creates the greater light and the lesser light, sun and the moon, and the lesser light. The moon. Sorry for my bad handwriting there. Number two, he separates, right? So you have, uh, you have basically, we can say, uh, the sky from the water. Maybe that's a shorthand way of thinking about it. And then we could say that he fills those with birds and fish. Then on day three, we have the land that emerges uh, from the water. And on day six, the thing that fills that land is animals, or are animals. And of course, man is the chief thing that fills that creation, that space of creation. So we have on the first three, these spaces, these floors of the three-story house. And then in the second three, something that uh, that fills and rules over uh, that space. Now, this is a really important point for us because it helps us to make some a couple of connections. The first, and this is really enumerated on um, in verse or in, on day four, uh, with the creation of the two lights, the greater light and the lesser light, the sun and the moon. Um, the text actually says that the, that these two lights ruled over the space of, uh, of, the, of the light and the dark. Uh, it's kind of an interesting term that the fact that the sun rules over the day and uh, the moon rules over uh, the darkness. We see this concept of ruling then kind of played out in many other places throughout the scriptures. One of the first places that it plays out is in Joseph's second dream that he has with his family. The first dream, if you recall, is about, uh, you know, he has this dream about uh, wheat and chaff. But then the second dream, he has this story that there's a sun, moon, and then 11 stars, and these sun, moon, and 11 stars are bowing down to him. Um, and what's interesting when you read that story is that his father knows right off the bat what he's talking about, right? He knows uh, that Jacob, uh, uh, that he is referring to um, himself, that his father, his mother, and his 11 brothers are going to be bowing down to him. And he rebukes him for that. Like, what are you talking about? Uh, you're the son. Uh, we're not going to bow down to you. You're equal with, uh, with your brothers. So we have this imagery then of sun and moon and stars, these things that rule over the first day, that space of the first day. We have this imagery uh, that helps us to understand uh, this concept of ruling. The same thing is picked up in Isaiah chapter 13. There, Isaiah says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of the heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. So we have all of this kind of, you know, it sounds like it's cosmic language, and they're talking about them uh, not putting forth their light. It sounds like there's this end to the universe that is coming, this end of the world, perhaps. But really, when you look at that text, what Isaiah is prophesying about is the end of Babylon. So this truly is an end of the world, but it's an end of, a, of this world that has Babylon as the most powerful nation uh, in it. It's talking about the, these, these lights are associated with the rule of Babylon. We see the same thing, of course, picked up by Jesus in the Olivet Discourse. Um, when you read that, it sounds like he's talking about, you know, this cosmological disaster. 
Um, but rather, he's talking about the passing away of this old rule, this old rule that was centered around Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem was supposed to be this blessing to the nations. Uh, it was to be the center of God's plan to, to do this amazing work. But of course, um, they didn't do that. They rejected the Messiah. They crucified the Messiah. And so they are going to be judged and eventually replaced by uh, the true Israel, which is Christ and his church, his followers. So, but we, but we really only begin, this is just an example, we really only begin to understand how that plays out if we pay careful attention to those opening phrases in the creation account, to the imagery that the Bible uses uh, that early on. And we get an indication, the second thing we get is an indication that since man is the final act of God's creation, and that he is filling this space of the land, then part of what it means for him to fill this space of the land is to rule over the land. There's a sense in which days four, five, and six, these are not just things that fill it, but there's a sense in which they rule over it. Uh, they enjoy freedom in it. So, you know, birds get to fly around in the sky, fish get to fly around in the sea, animals get to run around on the ground. There's a sense in which they rule over it, and man is the crowning achievement of uh, day six, and so man rules over creation. So paying attention to uh, just kind of this layout helps us to see a couple of those things. This also then becomes apparent in things that are said about man. Man, male and female, were created in the image of God. Man was called to be a reflection of God into the world. He was called uh, to image, to be a copy of God in a certain sense out in the world. So ideally, if man had been faithful, then there would have been a whole bunch of copies of God running around, running around doing creative things and being righteous and doing all of these wonderful things so that the whole world was full of all of these copies of God. Just as God created the world and structured it and restructured it, man, too, as an, as an image of God, is called to do the same thing. We're called to create and to restructure and to beautify all of creation so that it glorifies God. God, we can think about God as the ruler of everything, the king of kings, the king of everything. Well, man in his image, male and female, is to be kings, be kings uh, under God and queens under God that rule uh, his creation. He is to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and the animals. And as you all know, part of, his, part of the way in which he is going to complete this task is to uh, be fruitful and to multiply. He is to have children who are also made in the image of God and who will carry on this mission of being copies of God out in the world, doing all of those things that we just talked about. But of course, in order for him to do that, uh, in order for man to do that and for his children to do that, they have to actually be uh, uh, true to the thing that they reflect, right? So we can't just have children. We have to have children that reflect God's character and nature into the world, that love him and that want to serve him. So it's a little bit more complicated than obviously just having children. But in addition to filling the earth with more image-bearing children, children that love God and are copies of God into the world, Adam and Eve were to subdue the earth. They were to take that raw stuff of creation. They were to take the ground and the things in the ground. They were to take the animals and the plants. Uh, and they were to turn them into things uh, that could better and better serve their fellow man in God-honoring ways. So from this, we can kind of discern that Adam was not to just enjoy the pleasures of the garden. He wasn't just to be in the garden, to work it and keep it, and to worship God. Rather, he was to go out of the garden. He was to go into that land that was outside, the outlying lands, and work those and subdue those and to bring those into subjection. Uh, into the subjection of God. Listen to one Old Testament commentator here. He says, If people were going to fill the earth, we must conclude that they were not intended to stay in the garden in a static situation. 
Yet moving out of the garden would appear a hardship since the land outside the garden was not as hospitable as that inside the garden. Otherwise, the garden would not be distinguishable. So if the land weren't harder outside, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the garden on the inside and the land on the outside. Perhaps then we should surmise that people were gradually supposed to extend the garden as they went about subduing and ruling. Extending the garden would extend the food supply as well as extend the sacred space, since that is what the garden represented. So Adam wasn't just to stay in the garden and enjoy all the fruits of it and work it and keep it like a, you know, like a, a, a gardener that just enjoyed all these things. He was to do that, to be sure, but then also to go out of the garden into the outlying lands and to subdue uh, the rest of creation. Now, one of the ways that we can see this is by looking carefully at the zones of the land on which Adam lived and see how those zones kind of correspond to creation. So, uh, quickly, going back to creation, we have the highest heavens. That's the place where God dwells. Then below that, we have the firmament or the canopy or the sky, whatever you want to call it. Below that, we have the land, and below that, we have the sea. So we kind of have uh, these four areas, these four uh, areas of creation. We talked about the three-story house, but that doesn't include God's dwelling place. The three-story house is him uh, building this house of creation. Well, on the land, it might be better if we kind of put this up here. Uh, let's see, did I bring an eraser? I did not. Um, so we have, let's see. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Just need a little bit here. We have the highest heavens. Goodness. The firmament. Firmament. Land. And sea. Then, in creation, we have, so we have dwelling place of God here, and then we have these three, uh, these, the three-storied house. In creation, we have Eden, we have the garden, we have the outlying land, and then we have, uh, actually, it's the land to the east, and then the outlying land. To the east and the outlying land. Sometimes you can think about these in terms of like concentric circles, um, but it's a little bit hard because the relationship between the garden and Eden uh, is a little bit tricky. We'll talk about that uh, here in a minute. But you can see this correlation between the way that the whole of creation is structured uh, and uh, this land on which Adam is structured. There's this correlation between the two. Uh, also, of course, as you know, and you've probably heard many times, the rivers uh, flowed uh, out of Eden, out of the dwelling place where God was, into the garden. And this kind of implies that Eden was perhaps higher up uh, than the garden. They were probably adjacent to one another. Perhaps the garden was somehow... Uh, you know, within Eden in some sense, uh, that's where the concentric circles thing gets a little bit uh, wacky. But, uh, but nonetheless, Eden, the dwelling place of God, was higher up. And these, these rivers flow out of Eden, they flow into the garden, and from there they go uh, to the water, uh, the rest of the earth. Um, the source of life in Eden, God's dwelling place on earth, is of course symbolized by these waters that go out, and they're the things that irrigate the garden, and they go out to irrigate the rest of the world. And so then, because that was the source of life, God's dwelling place sends out uh, these uh, waters. We can kind of think about then Adam being in this garden that's adjacent to Eden, but also next to the lands to the east and to the outlying lands, that Adam was to both draw near to God and worship, and he was to go out into these other lands, these hinterlands, and subdue everything. That was kind of his mission. It can kind of be talked about in terms of his priestly mission 
but then also his kingly mission. He had a priestly mission of worshiping God, working in the garden. That's actually kind of what uh, the word means. Uh, and he had a kingly mission to go out and to subdue uh, the world. And really, one of the reasons why this is so important is because the exact same thing is true for us today. In a certain sense, we're called to do the exact same things that Adam was called to do. Adam was to draw near to God, to worship him, to hear his instruction, to be in a covenant relationship uh, with him. And that covenant relationship was life for him. But then, at the same time, he was to go out into the world and to transform that creation into something that better serves mankind and that honors God. And this is really important because it means then that we all are fulfilling these same callings, if we think about it. We too have a priestly mission. We too have kingly missions. Uh, we worship God. We hear his instruction. Our relationship is, rene is renewed every Sunday. But then we also have our kingly mission where we go out into the world and we work it and we subdue it and we cultivate it. And we take things that uh, aren't as good for man and we turn them into things that are better for man. We take things that are ugly and we turn them into things that are beautiful. We take things that uh, are just raw materials and we turn them into things that are finished products. Um, we think about this, you know, and I think we, re we really do need to think about this a lot. Uh, it's something that sometimes gets neglected. But really, every, every honorable job, uh, and by that I mean every job that is not, you know, illegal or immoral or something like that, Every honorable job is an aspect of this kingly task that God gives to man. Medicines and skill and knowledge of doctors and dentists and nurses, they remedy diseases. Even lawyers, right? We hate lawyers, but even lawyers, think about what they do. They enable the faithful keeping of contracts between two parties. They advocate for the oppressed and they prosecute those who are the oppressors. Uh, restaurant workers prepare food that is nourishing and delightful so that we can enjoy the wonderful things of God's creation. Teachers instruct and train children in things that will enable them to see the world rightly and then to go out and do a little bit of you know, subduing of their own, we could say. And we could go on and on and on talking about every single honorable vocation that there is. Everything is a kingly task. It's a noble task because that's the task that God has given us to do. Um, that's just a remarkable thing that I think uh, many times gets underemphasized because something, you know, might not pay a whole bunch or because something, you know, isn't the most glamorous of jobs. Well, from God's perspective, it kind of doesn't even matter. It's a kingly task because you're serving mankind and you're subduing creation. That's what he's called us to do. So we really need to think about that, I think, a whole lot more. You guys are probably all familiar with um, the quote from Abraham Kuyper, where he says, There is not a square inch in the domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry mine. Jesus is interested in everything, all of life. Every aspect of our human existence is something that Jesus is interested in and sovereign over, and he calls us to be involved in and to think carefully about. Uh, you might have heard me say this about a month or two ago, but there's kind of a lesser-known Reformed theologian named Gordon Spikeman, and he says something that I think, same concept, but just captures it really well. He says, nothing matters but the kingdom. But because of the kingdom, everything matters. So really, I think it's a really catchy way for us to think about it. Nothing matters except the kingdom of God. That's the only thing that we should be concerned about. But because that's the only thing we should be uh, thinking about and concerned about, everything matters because God's kingdom encompasses all of life. Every aspect of life is important to God and has to be subdued. And we Christians have to be out there subduing our, uh, our lands. Adam and his descendants, though, could only do that if they were faithful to God in their priestly task. So sometimes, you know, the Kyperians love to emphasize, you know, the not one square inch thing. Uh, but sometimes they do so to the neglect of the worshiping side. And you have to keep both of them together. 
Adam failed in his kingly task because he wasn't a good priest. You have to be faithful in our priestly task of worshiping, being obedient, hearing God's word, hearing his instruction, and that is what enables you to then go out and be a good king in whatever it is uh, that you do. So we have to remember that drawing near to God in obedience and in worship uh, is what really orients us properly so that we can go out and be good kings in whatever, whatever area uh, God puts us in. We need to think about how every aspect of our lives and every aspect of our work and our families fits into this. As we faithfully worship God, we're given the life and we're given the principles that we need to go out and then faithfully pursue the various callings that we have in work and life. A couple more things here about Adam's tasks before we move on. First of all, we've talked about this some here, but a a little bit more specifically. First of all, remember that Adam was to work and to keep the garden. Now, again, you might have heard this before, but these two words, work and keep, are the same words. It's very kind of interesting. They're the same words that get picked up in the early chapters of Numbers in talking about the priests and the Levites. The priests and the Levites were to work. They had the service of the tabernacle, and they had to guard the tabernacle. And it was a physical guarding, right? Uh, they, They literally physically guarded the entrance into the tent of meeting. Uh, you had, you know, different kind of clans of the Levites encamped all around the tabernacle to protect it and to make sure that nobody could come in and, and worship uh, however they pleased. Well, those same, those same words are the, are the words that are used uh, in God's commissioning to Adam to work and to keep the garden. So this really kind of helps us to think about what he was supposed to do in this priestly task. The word for... Uh, for to work, as I said, I think earlier, is the same word that's used sometimes in reference to uh, the service and sometimes even the worship service. So Adam, in his priestly task, had to do a couple of things. He had his worship service that he had to do with God. Uh, he had to be worshipful to God, and he had to guard the garden. He had to prevent uh, intruders from coming in. He had to guard the meaning of God's word, the truth of God's word. He had to prevent uh, people from trying to uh, take anything away from that. Working and serving in the garden then and guarding it was a worshipful thing. And this, of course, is what Adam failed to do. He was given a priestly task to worship God, to guard that worship uh, and the truth of God's word, And he was given a kingly task in which he was to go out of the garden and to subdue uh, the outlying lands. He was to go out there and to subdue them, to bring them into subjection of uh, his control and authority in order to then glorify the garden and, we could say, to extend the borders of the garden out into these outlying lands. Adam is allowed to eat of the tree of life. Think about how kind of amazing this is. He's allowed to eat of the tree of life. He's allowed to have anything he wants. All of creation is there for him to subdue, but he fails in his service to God. He fails in his priestly task by, of course, as we know, allowing Satan to deceive his wife, and he dies. But of course, the Lord is gracious to him. Uh, He provides a covering for him, but He still dies in the sense that he is removed from the garden. And two cherubim with flaming swords guard the entrance to the garden. He is removed from God's presence, and that presence is his very life. And so he dies. Now, one of the things that is interesting and I think very helpful for us to think about is what would have happened to Adam if he hadn't sinned? What would have happened to Adam if he was actually faithful in his priestly duties and then his kingly duties? Well, of course, the Bible doesn't specifically tell us, but I think there are some strong indications that tell us that he uh, would have matured and been glorified as he was obedient to God. 
And there's a, a lot of different kind of lines to this argument, but I think one of the most interesting and convincing is Paul's discussion of the resurrection in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Uh, Paul is talking about the resurrection and what our resurrection bodies uh, will be like. Uh, but what's interesting is that he mentions the first Adam and how this first Adam became a living soul. So, just, just for a second here, that's, that's the way that Adam is described as he is just created. So this is pre-fall Adam. This is Adam before sin has entered into the world. And as he's talking about Adam uh, as this living soul, he also says that the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And he's starting to set up this contrast between the two. The first Adam is this living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, is a life-giving spirit. But then he goes on to say, this is Paul here in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, but it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. So he's talking about a progression from the natural to the spiritual. And it's interesting here that natural, physical, is not a bad thing. It's not a, it's not a sinful thing to be natural and physical. But nonetheless, there's still a progression from this natural and physical body to this spiritual body. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of the dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So he's talking about these two different types of bodies. The physical, natural physical body in Adam and the spiritual body, the resurrection body, we could say, of Christ. And he's saying that we are men of dust, but we're born of that image. But at the very same time, we will inherit, we shall also bear the image of the man of of heaven. Now it's interesting here to notice that Paul is comparing, again, Adam's pre fall physical nature, which was not sinful, to then, he's contrasting these two things, to the spiritual nature of Christ, who is from heaven. He is the life giving spirit. Listen to one commentator here. He says, Paul's understanding, therefore, is that even if Adam had never sinned, his pre-fall existence still needed to be transformed at some climactic point into an irreversible, glorious existence, which Paul identifies as resurrection existence. So, thinking about this clearly then, had Adam been obedient, had he not sinned, he still, through his obedience, he would have matured and been glorified, to some irreversible, glorious body, something perhaps like Jesus' uh, resurrection body. Now, of course, again, the Bible doesn't say this, but I think we can draw some implications here. Accordingly, then, we can say that Paul understood that Adam would have been rewarded with a transformed, incorruptible body if he had remained faithful. So, and I think this is really helpful for us because it means that Adam's time in the garden wasn't some sort of like probationary period. I'm going to put you in there and just kind of see what happens. And you're probably going to sin because I know everything. Uh, that's not what, that's not the situation. Rather, God put Adam in there and he really wanted him to be faithful and he really wanted him to subdue the earth. He was to progress. And as he progressed, he was to be glorified as he was faithful. He would have been rewarded with maturity and knowledge to reign, and he would share in the glory of God uh, to a greater and greater extent as he progressed in his communion with God. So I think that's just kind of a helpful thing for us to think about. Uh, that this period is not just, not just a probationary period where we're seeing what Adam's going to do. Rather, Adam truly had a mission, and God empowered him to do that mission, but he truly did sin and fail. Now, there's a pattern here that we need to recognize that I think is very helpful, and we're going to come back to this <clears throat> here in a minute or two. I owe you one, Ronnie, for the <laughs> handkerchief. If we think about the first creation...
there is chaos uh, over the waters. There is a created order that we've talked about. There's this structure that is imposed on this chaos. There's a commissioning of Adam. There is Adam's sin. And there is judgment. There's no E in judgment. And exile. So, we'll just keep that pattern in mind here because this is a pattern that recurs over and over and over. And we have to keep in mind what we were just talking about, that Adam truly was equipped to do the things that he was called to do and that he was truly expected to do these things. Just like Noah is, just like Israel is, Abraham, they all uh, were equipped to be faithful and were uh, asked and required to be faithful. Uh, but they are... They are not, up until we get to the last Adam, obviously. So this pattern is, is important because um, it's kind of the same way that God's people act throughout uh, biblical history. And uh, one of the things that it also shows is that God doesn't just give up on his people. Even though Adam is sinful and he is judged and he is sent into exile, uh, he doesn't just give up. Well, he starts something new, and he does it again and again and again until the last Adam does it uh, well. And actually, of course, when we look at the curse that is given to Satan, we see that there is a promise for final victory. The serpent will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the seed of the serpent. This is what's been called the first gospel. This is the first good news. Even in these very early chapters of Genesis, there is still an announcement of good news that the seed of the woman is going to bruise the head of the serpent. And so God's people, uh, Israel, we, all of us, we uh, can anticipate. Well, not we, we know what happens, but they're all anticipating uh, this seed of the woman to crush uh, the serpent's head. After their expulsion from the garden we see that man continues in this path of disobedience to God's ways. You all know this. Cain kills Abel, uh, and Cain is also cast out of the land. Just like Adam and Eve are cast out of the garden, Cain is cast out of the land. The sons of God intermarry with the daughters of men, and you all probably know this, but this doesn't refer to the intermarrying of you know, angels and uh, pretty women. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, although there's a lot of people that disagree on that one. Um, I think, yeah, I think when you look at kind of the flow of the story there, it seems fairly obvious to me. Rather, so, rather it means, you know, the godly line of Seth is intermarrying with the ungodly line, likely descendants uh, from Cain. And because of this, because of this intermarrying, then the world increases in its uh, wickedness enormously, and we see a similar casting out. They are cast out this time not just of the land, but of the whole world in the flood. But after the flood, we see the same sort of commission that was given to Adam, now given to Noah. So he is in a new way. God is starting this new thing, this new creation. He is, therefore, a type of new Adam. So listen to the similarities of the commission that is given to Noah as to that that is given to Adam. Chapter 9 of Genesis says, that God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. It's almost the exact same thing that's given uh, to Adam. Rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, what's interesting here is to look back here at this cycle. So we have, now we have uh, the flood slash Noah. The same cycle happens. So we have chaos in the flood, right? Waters cover the whole earth. We have a new order that emerges from the chaos. We have almost the exact same commissioning that's given to Noah. 
Then we have the sin primarily of Ham uh, that kind of begins to unravel things. And there is a judgment and, and an exile, in a sense, of Ham. Of course, his son Canaan becomes kind of the primary recipient of the curse, but there's still judgment and exile uh, that comes upon, upon him. So it's interesting here, the, almost the exact same commission, almost the exact same cycle happens. But of course, this new creation with this new Adam ultimately fails uh, to honor and to glorify God, and that kind of culminates in the wickedness of the Tower of Babel. And here at Babel, as you all probably know, the exact opposite of what man is supposed to do is what happens. The people gather together. What are they supposed to do? What are God's people supposed to do? They're supposed to go out and to subdue the earth, right? But they gather together. They're supposed to glorify God and subdue creation in order to uh, serve mankind and glorify God, and rather they try to make a name for themselves. So these people are doing almost the exact opposite thing that God's people are supposed to do. And so God comes down and he confuses their language and he scatters them. But then, of course, and we're going to try to go through the rest of Genesis here very quickly, he initiates action. God initiates action. So after this, the cycle kind of, you know, goes through and, and uh, seems like there's no hope, well, God initiates action and he does something else. And this time, of course, he calls Abraham. Now, once again, I'm going to read a couple of uh, excerpts from the times that God enters into a relationship, calls him, enters into a covenant with him, covenant of circumcision. There's so many allusions to that initial calling or that initial commissioning of Adam in Genesis 1.28. Um, it's really kind of amazing. And so what we see when we think about then, think about that then, is that God is renewing his initiative to fill the world with, fill this three-story world with people who love him and want to glorify him and fill the earth uh, with people who are exactly uh, image bearers uh, like him. So listen carefully here. This is from Genesis 12 to some of the similarities going all the way back to the commission that God gave to Adam. God says, and I will make you a great nation and I will bless you. That's how the commission to Adam starts off. And I will make your name great so that you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Adam is to go out and to subdue all the earth. Well, now God is saying that through you, I am going to bless all the families of the earth. So the two kind of key links here are blessing. God has blessed him, and he's going to bless those who bless him. And filling. God is going to fill the earth through these uh, families uh, that will be blessed by Abraham. Listen again now to, uh, this is in chapter 17 with the covenant of circumcision. God says, I will establish my covenant between me and you, and I will multiply you exceedingly. So I'm going to be fruitful and multiply you. I'm going to multiply you exceedingly. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will give to you and to your descendants after you the land of your sojourning. Go out and subdue the land. I'm going to give you the land. Be fruitful. I'm going to make you fruitful. So we, we talked a little bit about the continuity between that initial commission that was given to Adam and now Noah and now with Abraham. But there's also some discontinuity here. Uh, there's something uh, that is unique to this one. Did anybody pick up on that? There's a shift that takes place. And that is that what used to be kind of a command is now a promise. So Adam, Noah are told to go out, to be fruitful, to multiply, uh, to fill the earth and to subdue it. And now it gets reversed and it's going to stay this way throughout the rest of redemptive history. Now God promises to do that for him, for Abraham, as he is faithful. I will make you exceedingly great. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will give you the land to you and to your descendants, the land of your sojournings. Um, so it's a really kind of a subtle shift, but a very, very important one, um, because it's, it's a bit of a shift in the way that God is doing business. Uh, he is going to go before his people. He's going to bless them as they are faithful to him. 
Um, this gets reiterated again when Abraham offers Isaac as a sacrifice. In chapter 22, he says, uh, when you know Abraham has just been faithful, ready to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice, God says, I will greatly bless you and I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And your seed, all the nations of the earth, shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So again, there's lots and lots of kind of connections with that original, that original commission. And the same thing gets passed down uh, to Isaac as well. In chapter 26, God appears to Isaac and he says, Don't go down to Egypt, sojourn here in this land, and I will be with you and I will bless you. That's the first connection. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and I will give to your offspring all these lands, and your offspring all the nations shall be blessed. The promise. So the promise, the same continuity of this promise that God gives to Abraham was given to Isaac, and it gets handed down to Jacob as well. After uh, being deceived with the help of uh, Rebekah, as you all know that story, Isaac blesses his son uh, Jacob a second time just as he sends him off to Paddan Aram to, for, for a wife. And this is how the blessing goes. He says, God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, that you may become a company of peoples. May he give the blessing of Abraham to you and to your offspring with you, that you may take possession of the land of your sojourning that God gave Abraham. So the same promise, this, this uh, commission that was given to Adam, this commission that's given to Noah, that becomes a promise for Abraham and Isaac, is now a promise that is given to Jacob as well. As you guys all know, uh, Jacob spends a long time striving with Laban for his wives and his family and his, and his possessions, and he finally... Uh, leaves Laban and he encounters Esau and he strives, of course, has striven with Esau uh, before. Uh, and then he finally comes and he encounters God. And we find out that God actually was working through Jacob's difficulties with his father, Jacob's difficulties with Laban and da uh, Jacob's difficulties with Esau. God was working through all of them to mature Jacob. And then finally, of course, Jacob wrestles and he strives uh, with God. That's kind of the culmination of his, of his striving. So now Jacob is this mature man. He's renamed Israel. And uh, God blesses him now uh, one more time where he says, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you and kings shall come forth from you. The land which I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your descendants after you. And then finally, so we see kind of the continuity here going all the way to Israel now. Finally, it uh, is passed on to Joseph as well. Joseph, as you all know, is sold into slavery, and he becomes a slave in Potiphar's house. He's imprisoned, and he interprets dreams, and he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. And Egypt becomes this storehouse of food uh, to feed the nations. And Joseph becomes, uh, as you all know, extremely powerful through his faithful service. That's what enables him to get to the status and position that he is in. Uh, so his faithful service elevates him to this position of authority. And eventually uh, he is able to be instrumental to perhaps convert a lot of uh, Egypt and to then bless his own family that is stricken by uh, the famine. Listen to verse uh, chapter 47, though, uh, where we see a very similar thing uh, that I think connects all of these stories of the patriarchs. Chapter 47, verse 27, says that now Israel lived in the land of Egypt in Goshen, and they acquired property in it and were fruitful and became very numerous. So, this is, you know, this has been a broad kind of summary survey of, of, uh, of Genesis. But I think, um, you know, we talked about a lot of things in the beginning, but ultimately the main theme that runs through the entire book 
is God's mission. He's built this three-story house of of the creation, and he wants to fill this three-story house with a bunch of wonderful image-bearing people that are going to reflect his righteousness and his character and his creativity into all of the world. Uh, And he tells that over and over and over to his people. And then, of course, with Abraham, he flips it around and he makes it a promise. He promises to do that, and we see that ultimately as the case at the very end of of Genesis. Uh, Israel's living in Egypt now, and they kind of have done at least a good portion of what God has said that he would do for them. They have acquired property, and they are very fruitful. They become very numerous. So, in spite of Adam's sin, God was still accomplishing through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, you know, renamed as Israel, that original commission that is given to Adam to take that three-story house of the creation and transform it. The priestly tasks of worshiping and obeying God and the kingly tasks were being done by Abraham and his descendants so that all of the world would be blessed. So we see at least uh, at least some of that in Genesis. Obviously, there's a lot more uh, going on, but uh, that is at least a brief overview. Are there any questions or comments? Yeah. yeah. The what's given men, sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah. With Abraham, his wife is mentioned, it's also we see that his sons yeah. are given a yeah. 1.8, sons of the family close together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, um, I think you could. So, wait, what's your question? I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I think you could still kind of, you know, we see we see the pattern in Genesis that, you know, Adam can't do his job of subduing and filling without Eve, his wife. So there's, there's kind of, you know, there's a, uh, you know, a corporate nature to it right off the bat. And the same thing is, is true for the others as well. Um, Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Do you know? No, I'm sure Jim did. But there you go. Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess we have some, yeah. some homework to do. Then. Yeah. Right. So, and his name is Israel, which is what Israel was for the end of yeah. the yeah. the rest of his time. So, like, he is that analogy, but he's also not an unblemished lamb. In a sacrificial sense, he can no longer be the sacrifice. You know, God has to come down and intervene again with the second Adam. You know, it just seems to be symbolic language. I yeah. Think. Yeah. You know, of course, they certain words are just getting picked up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. If only Devin had been there. But. That's there in the story. In the net of the story. In the narrative. Yeah. So clearly, that what, what, what changes because of these things in terms of, you know, it is a, a, a carnal, physical covenant. Yeah. You know, yeah. Now you have something that's disrupted the body that it, that it represents. It's no longer unblemished. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Yeah. Yeah, and it's yeah, it's fairly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Okay, so next week will be uh, Israel up through Judges. About it's a lot in one class, but that's okay. That's that's what we're doing. All right, thank you all very much. Let me close this in prayer. If there's nothing else, Father in heaven, thank you again for your word, and thank you for teaching us. Uh, 
what the beginnings are and so that we can know how we are to live and what we're supposed to do and that it's good and honoring in your sight. Uh, we thank you for the gift of work and for the gift of worship. We ask, Lord, that you'll help us to be faithful in each of these things, in our priestly task of worshiping and obeying uh, and discerning and, uh, and guarding our worship service, but also, Lord, help us to take uh, those, uh, the life that you give us and the precepts that you give us out into the world to subdue it and to make it more serviceable to man and glorifying to you. Be with us this evening, Lord. Be with all of our families, and we ask uh, that you will bless our night's sleep and our day tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen.